Okay, good day. Good evening. Um, I promised I would put a video uh, together for you uh, as a group, and uh, I know that there were some questions during class that I wasn't able to get to, so let's, uh, let's take some time and do this. Um, what I have in front of me is uh, the assignment number two, uh, worth um, 30 plus marks. I'll talk about the plus after. Um, and the, the instructions in there, I'm not going to be reading this word for word. Uh, understand that this is on LMS and you can obviously download it if you haven't yet. Make sure that this is what you do hand in with all of your answers and screen captures. Screen captures are going to be how you are going to prove that you uh, are working with the data in ArcGIS Pro and uh, following the instructions and, and so on. So. Um, like I said, I'm not going to read through uh, each of these words that are here, but understand that we're going to be working with Landsat 8 and 9 sensors. Um, we've already had a tutorial with regards to downloading Glovis data, uh, sorry, Landsat 8 and 9 data using the Glovis interface. There are other web applications where you can download Landsat data. Um, we just learned the Glovis one, that's all. So um, let's get right to it. I have a bunch of different things going on. I've got this Word document here. And uh, I also have a copy of the tutorial document right here with regards to uh, downloading from the Glovis uh, application. And really, um, I think I also have uh, the Glovis application here. Um, I've got Arc open in a few different places, right? We've got um, that Landsat stuff. Remember, we were able to uh, search different areas uh, previously you know Sault Ste. Marie has a specific path and row associated with it uh, you could search for I don't know like for today uh, I'm really interested in this place right here um, it's right by Seoul Korea and uh, if we were to go there and zoom out a little bit you'll see that there's some really interesting coastline going on and uh, it's in a different UTM zone and it's a different part of the world uh, I'm gonna I actually have downloaded loaded some uh, stuff from Glovis uh, and we're going to play around with it. Downloaded one from there and then I also downloaded another scene from uh, Uganda. So who knows what we can get up to, right? Uh, remember we were uh, playing around with uh, this area here, right? There was uh, Alaska and we downloaded together in class. We downloaded stuff where here's Cairo, right? And here's uh, Terra Grande and Bahamas so on so like there's there's some things that we'll be talking about and really a uh, quick refresher on the Glovis interface here um, you need to select a data set using the interface controls right so when you do that right you got to make sure you choose Landsat 8, Landsat 8 and 9 you add those and then all of a sudden it's going to start looking for Landsat 8 data perfect but you're going to end up with a lot of data so a lot of different scenes and you've got to filter them out so I'm gonna do a quick uh, very quick tutorial on how to filter them and I'm gonna use Seoul Korea and that area as as an example and why well I just think oh I just missed it where did it go oh it's way over here <laughs> there we go it's right on the border here there's, there's a section Google Maps, right? If you zoom in a little bit on Google Maps, this area just looks really interesting. And I learned a little bit about it as well. Right? You can put it in 3D here if you want to check it out. I learned a little bit about Seoul, Korea, and uh, the this particular um, area. They've been doing a lot of aquaculture lately, um, which is really neat to think about. Um, in these areas, there are a lot of these like water cages, right? And um, in the imagery, we're, we're gonna get to see a lot of that. So um, aquaculture in this area has increased and it turns out that there's like 70% production increase and they make a lot of seaweed and they grow a lot of uh, seafood. Pretty cool. Well, why would that be important? Well, we're gonna see it on the Landsat imagery. Anyways. I've got 256 scenes and I've got to narrow that down. This one that's showing is full of clouds. So let's get rid of the clouds. Those clouds, we don't want those clouds. So 
I've basically clicked on the common metadata filters plus sign to get this and then drop down here says cloud cover I'm going to reduce that to zero and add that filter and see what happens it's going to bring uh, our number way way down I would hope yeah wait right down to 18 um, we do want them all to be during the day so this data set metadata filter I will put on there for this and we're going to say day night one day Right, and we've done this already in class, so I'm not going to like take a lot of time, but we've, now we're down to 13. Um, I also, uh, well, you know what, let's go to 5% cloud, because 13 may not be enough. So let's apply that filter. Every time you change anything in this interface, on the left-hand side, you've got to apply the filter, and it'll like refresh and find. We've got 54 scenes now, good, uh, but we want them in the summer. The summertime for Seoul, Korea is, let's say, May through till October. We're going to filter those and see what happens. Now we're down to 15. Okay, 15 scenes to, to choose from. Well, they're all right there. When are they? And curious, uh, what is the path and row? Now, we, I had downloaded some stuff for Iceland. And we've downloaded uh, that stuff for Cairo. And it's all over, you know, in different areas. That is written right into the file name here. This little scene navigator is pretty handy. It tells you what you're looking at, right? This this selected scene right here is path 116 and row 34. Um, I can go and actually double check. Uh, yeah, look at this, 116 and 34 it matches up, right, with the uh, with that scene right there. So kind of neat. This is just like an index. Uh, guy right here right so I think that's pretty neat double click to get right into uh, the city I believe I'm pronouncing it wrong but we'll go for it Incheon 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 um, let's go back to clothes and figure out which one we want right because by clicking this timeline and opening it up I can see that uh, currently it's sitting on 2013. Uh, I'm going to go through these until I see one that I like. There's three from 2014. And I just want to see what they look like. Not bad, not bad. 2015. See, this one has cloud and it has uh, the season is telling me it's May the 1st. There's not a lot of veg happening here, so or a lot of vegetation uh, that's very lively. So I'm going to keep going through. A little bit greener there. Let's keep going through 2016. I don't know how that one even got in there because it's got way too much cloud. That's weird, but we'll keep going. Ooh. I actually think I really like this one the best because when I look closely, um, there's a lot of interesting textures and shapes and so on happening in the uh, land versus water interface, so to speak. So I, I want to download it. In fact, it's the one that I did download. It is uh, Path 116, Row 34, and it's from May the 19th of 2016. Cool. Uh, now, refresher for downloading. You click the download button, and it gives you some options. I've been telling everybody to download the large file size, the 1.1 gig here. It could be a little bit less. So they're all generally about 1 gig in size. And uh, right, you would go to download it, and uh, once you have it downloaded, right, let me see if I can find uh, the folder where it's downloaded. No, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I do have the project where it belongs. Let's, let's do that. Um, I would rather do that than show all of uh, the things right here. This is uh, the exercise that everybody in class had, right? So there's, uh, there was an Iceland map, and then there was a blank map as well. Now what I've done is uh, I've added this scene to, as a folder connection that has all of the data for that area in um, Korea. I'm going to show you a trick for getting it into the uh, contents pane or into your map. Uh, in such a way that 
numbers. Now notice I've clicked on number 11, now I'm clicking on number 1, but, and I'm also holding down shift. It selects all of them. This is like a multi-select way, right? So the shift key helps you to do that. And then I'm just going to drag and drop them into the table of contents right here. Now when you do it, you may be prompted to build pyramids and calculate statistics. Please do that for all of them. Uh, for the sake of um, efficiency, I've already built all of them. I used a, um, a geoprocessing uh, thing called batch calculate statistics. This thing right here. Uh, it allows you to drag and drop things in there or you can multi-select. There's another one called batch build pyramids that's really good right here and that's for again uh, building pyramids and statistics is a really important thing for us it allows you to to zoom in and zoom out very quickly and the statistics themselves are really really built or set up for symbology so uh, those have been built and the geoprocessing uh, tasks are pretty simple to run um, so I've got those into the, the map right now and here they are um, and you'll see that in my contents pane, I'm just going to cinch them all up. They're in order from 1 to 11. If yours aren't in order from 1 to 11, then make sure that you put them in that order. And then use the shift key again. By holding it down, you can select all of them. I want everybody to group them together. So right click after you've selected them and say group. And we're going to name this layer based on a few things. We're going to say what the sensor is. So it's LCO8. That's Landsat8. And I'm going to go underscore. But now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say path or P and it's 116. And then I'm going to go underscore. And I'm going to say row R and it's row 34. So row 34. The next thing I'm going to do is I want to actually have the date of acquisition as part of this group name. And you might be like, well, why are you, why are you doing that? Nineteenth, twenty, twenty sixteen, <laughs> twenty sixteen, not twenty twenty three. So when I do that, uh, what it does is it helps me to keep these things organized. See, I've got one group in here. Now, if I were to, if I were to have more data or a greater number of Landsat scenes or Sentinel scenes or any other satellite imagery or aerial imagery or whatever, and I needed to have a listing of them, right? I don't want to get things confused, right? At least I want to be able to turn them all off at once if I want very quickly okay and and you'll see that in this map the Iceland map right I have two groups I have one from May 28th 2022 and I have another from May 29th 2022 right and we'll be talking about them as I go like I may jump over here and, and do things I can turn this one on as well and if you're in class you'll remember what we were doing with uh, this data so again uh, I've dragged in this data from Incheon Korea South Korea and uh, let's start playing with it. The assignment is asking you things like, well, where is this place? What's the path of road to date of the acquisition and the total size? Okay, well, there's a few things that we could do. There's a few things that we do know already. Uh, for me, I'm going to type this in. I'm going to say, in South Korea. To say that this was path 116, I remember that, and row 034. Why is that important? Well, you're going to get four marks if you put it in there. Um, of course, you're going to be using different data, so you're going to be inputting your data uh, or your the information about your imagery. Remember, I asked people to download their own imagery. If you really wanted to, you could use the sample imagery uh, for Iceland that's in the map project that was provided and that's no problem uh, it's just if you use your own imagery you're going to get bonus marks because you've gone that extra step and you've said okay I'm going to download my own imagery from the Globus application and you're handling the uh, the extraction process and keeping the, the data safe maybe you've got to back it up to the, the cloud and all of that right so you get extra marks for that uh, the date of acquisition was May 19th 2016 and the total size uh, 
well, what is the total size? How do I find that out? Um, what I like to do is uh, look at the metadata. And I was going to wait to bring this metadata in, but I guess I'll drag it across now. And what I mean is, there's a file in here called, uh, same name as everything else, but it's got an MTL uh, tag on the end of it. It's a metadata layer that tells uh, you about the satellite. So see how you can expand it in the catalog pane. And the multi-spectral one, I'm just gonna I'm gonna drag it in and put it in this group here. And notice that it's it's color data. I'm not gonna worry about how it looks or anything like that, but I'm gonna pull the properties from it by right-clicking. And in those properties I can tell you how large the file is. That's just one of many uh, of its uh, properties. The raster information here tells you how many columns and rows, number of bands, the cell size. There's the file size right there. 952 and a half megabytes. Almost a gig. They're all about a gig. So uh, if I put that in over here, I am uh, done with that and I get my four marks and I can move on. Um, so this uh, tells you to move things around and to get it set up and uh, it says to open up a project and uh, get things or open up this project and bring the data in it says to remove all the base map layers and what I mean by that is um, you'll notice that I very rarely use base maps unless uh, I'm only dealing with um, in this case vectors right vectors load very quickly um, if you've got a raster data set you've got to think about uh, coordinate system conflicts Right, so Landsat data being in uh, WGS84 UTM uh, usually is okay with uh, these um, base maps in the background, but I just I, I avoid them because it's it's extra drawing that needs to be done. And let's focus on just the rasters themselves. But so that's what it's saying. It says remove the base maps if those are uh, in there by default. Um, it says there's another map in the project. If you do not have a copy of your own do downloaded Landsat data to use for this exercise, please continue using the Iceland map and its layers, right? So um, I can show you that as we go along, but I did all of that demonstration last week during class, so I'd like to keep moving. Uh, what is the coordinate system of uh, this data? That's interesting. If I remember right, Iceland was like UTM 27 or 28 or something along those lines. Uh, we can quickly find out what the uh, data here is just by looking at it, its properties, right? So we were just in its properties, and we just have to look for the spatial reference. There it is. 52, that's what it is. Cool. Completely different uh, UTM zone. So i just throw that right there. I'll be done with it. Now, of course, if you are using and downloading your own imagery, uh, I'm expecting your UTM zones to match your data, right? So, like up here, you told me what the path in the row was and the date of acquisition and all of that. Well, uh, your UTM zone should be matching the, the zone or, or the, uh, the path in row that your data has is, is been given in, right? So, that's really important. So, the right click menu is useful for accessing uh, symbology. And so on. Uh, please add the, the symbology pane if it's not already there, uh, and dock it somewhere that's convenient, but also give yourself enough room to see all of its options. So, what I mean by that is over here, um, you can see this is the symbology pane. I just dragged it away from um, the this right here. I'm going to turn off the multispectral, and I'm also going to turn off all of these. Notice what's happening in the symbology pane. I'm going to talk about that in a second turn all of these layers off, there's nothing to symbolize, right? And I also have multiple layers selected. So what's going on is there's a connection between the symbology pane and the contents pane. Whatever you have selected in the contents pane is going to be in this, the uh, symbology pane. And it's the contents pane that makes it visible or invisible. And it's the symbology pane where you can, you can modify the, the way that it's being displayed. In other words, you can bump up the contrast and you can bump up or down the gamma. Uh, whether it's color or not, this is not color data right now, it's just a single uh, band. 
one band. It's not three band color, right? That's what's up here. This multispectral is a three band image and we will be talking about in, it in more depth later. But what we need to do is focus on identifying the bands, understanding which wavelength range is what is which, and uh, getting an idea as to what Earth surface features look like in these different wavelength ranges. And we're gonna isolate them one band at a time. And that's really the purpose of this, you know, first part of the, the lesson. So, you know, you can, um, I'm gonna take the symbology pane and I'm gonna drag it over here. Notice how you can, you can dock things and undock things. So I'm gonna drag it and when I let go, uh, there it is, it's ready and I can see everything. So um, we've got values associated with this very first band, band number one. Band number one is the coastal aerosol band. Okay, it's kind of, it's in the visible portion of the spectrum. It's uh, kind of a little bit uh, higher frequency than blue, uh, but it still is just on the edge of uh, the blue part of the spectrum. And if I wanted to make it look better, you know, I could increase the contrast. Right now it just looks pretty gray. Okay, it just looks pretty gray. Right? So, you know, you zoom in and things just don't look that great. So I'm just going to close that off and let's, let's play around. Right? Uh, I'm going to bump up the contrast to its, like, maximum contrast. And that's using a stretch type. The maximum contrast would be something like histogram equalize. If I do that, then boom, whoa, look at all of that contrast. Way too much. I can't even see what's going on with so much contrast. It's pretty interesting to look at. It's very, you know visually uh, stimulating, but whoa, too much, right? So let's let's turn that down a bit by uh, choosing something else. Like here's minimum, maximum. Um, this is showing the entirety of the uh, histogram. Like it's showing all of the levels. The problem is, is that you kind of have to turn up the gamma by quite a bit uh, to get some brightness out of it, but then you're not getting a lot of contrast. So that's not very fun. Let's, uh, or two even, it's still not a lot of contrast. So is there a way to increase contrast, but also see as many gray levels as possible? Absolutely. What I personally like to do is uh, I like to use the percent clip. And I like to tone down the amount of clipping that's happening. So instead of 2% clip at the bottom, I use 0.1%. And as far as uh, the top goes, this is the highest, the whitest, uh, brightest pixels. I only clip them by 0.1%. And what that does is it, it lets you see uh, a very uh, kind of nice amount of um, contrast. Now, I've got my gamma up too high. It's at 200% kind of. It's at 2. Now, if you put it back down to 1, there you go. This looks almost like just a regular black and white picture that you would see, you know, hanging on the wall at uh, some old restaurant or something, right? It's kind of neat. Um, so that right there, percent clip, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and a gamma between 1 and 2. 2 for this image is a little bit high. Now remember, um, for Iceland, it was kind of neat. Um, the symbology that we used there was percent clip and 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 and the gamma we used there was 2. Now there's a reason for that and that is um, it always just depends what's in the image, right? So uh, this area of Iceland has a lot of snow and glaciers and, and things that are very very bright and there's kind of like a trade-off where there's like a really high brightness while a lot of the other things in there are going to be kind of looking a lot darker. So in order to compensate for that, we're still clipping it by 0.1% to, to you know, get as close to a minimum maximum as we, as we can. But uh, that's what has been asked. And you'll notice that in the um, tutorial, it asks you to do that as well. Right here, it says stretch type, percent, clip. Minimum 0 0.1, maximum 0 0.1, and a gamma of 2, okay? And you need to just have a think and um, decide what you feel is going to be the proper amount of gamma. 
There's 1.2. I think I could live with that. But here it is. If you're going to choose the amount of gamma to add to this percent clip contrast stretch, I want you to use the same amount of gamma across all of the bands in this project so that we can go through each band one by one and get a good idea as to what types of earth surface features are reflecting higher or lower, brighter or darker, um, with the same contrast stretches applied. So, you know, on band number three, you might notice that there's a brightness that comes into vegetation. Well, band three is green, and you may see that vegetation looks a little bit brighter. On band four, you might notice that the water gets a little bit darker and so on. So let's go through that process and I'm going to sort of just uh, be working through it and I'm going to use a gamma of just straight up one for all of this. Uh, band number one is done. I'm going to uncheck it. I'm going to turn on band number two. In fact, I'm going to turn all of them on and work through them one by one. So band number one is done with. I turn it off and this is band number two. So you select the band and then you do it symbology. So stretch type, percent clip, 0.1, right? And we'll leave the gamma at 1. Perfect. Uh, that's done. I'm going to turn it off. This next one, same thing, stretch type, percent clip, 0.1. There it is. Now, does it look different? It does. Look, the uh, you're seeing, if you toggle between them, and all I'm doing is turning off the blue band to expose the green band. In the green, the water gets a little bit darker, but the vegetation gets a little bit brighter. Hmm. That's a good observation, right? So uh, let's keep moving. Here's the red band. So percent clip, 0.1. And once you have these done, then you've kind of gotten them done. Now in the red band, you can see for sure that there has been a change. Look at how much darker the water gets, right? Interesting to think about. And number five, we're going to see a big change because this is where it goes from the red band into a non-visible component of the electromagnetic spectrum. It goes into the near-infrared band. We can't see that with our eyeballs, so things aren't going to be reflecting the same way you would expect them to. Uh, percent clip. Look at that. Everything just goes really strange. Water is really dark, and the land is extremely bright, especially areas that have been vegetated or are vegetated. So there's some cool things happening here. Really cool patterns. I just, I absolutely love looking at Landsat imagery. It's so cool. And I've never seen this one before, so very, very cool. Look at all this. What is all of this? What is happening in there? Cool. Anyways, uh, let's keep going. Band number six. Uh, we need to go to a stretch type of percent clip. Whoa. 0.1. Band number seven. See, I have to select it in order to make this work. Right? Uh, the symbology pane will only interact with the selected layer in the contents pane. Remember that, because it can get confusing if you're working with multiple layers to keep track of what's going on. This is interesting. Look at how much brighter the land is in band five, the near infrared band compared to band 7, which is a shortwave infrared 2 band. Cool. Even the water is different. I like it. So, um, that's done, that's done. This is the panchromatic band. When we do the panchromatic band, we're going to see some interesting things happen. I don't know if you can see it, but everything is sharper. Everything is very crisp looking. Uh, the Spatial resolution here is 15 meters, not 30. Um, I'll come back to it, but it is really interesting to see that as well. So um, keep it the same. 
far as the contrast stretching goes. Right? There we go. It looks like a really cool black and white image. Uh, we can even zoom in to see how, how close we can zoom in. We're basically at the maximum resolution of the panchromatic band. Turn that off. This is the cirrus band right here. Uh, not super interesting, to be honest, except for the fact that clouds really, really do show up. Like here we go. So we can zoom out and you'll see what I mean. Um, it may look like there's no clouds in this image, right? But on the cirrus band, we are definitely having a challenge uh, associated with the atmosphere and uh, there's some striping going on here as well and um, I don't know a lot about why that striping is there in the cirrus uh, band but there are there are high level clouds in this image that's what I that's all I know about the cirrus band I'm not uh, gonna go too much further into it this one band number 10 uh, is associated with uh, a big wide open atmospheric window in it's uh, in the thermal infrared, and this is actually a completely different sensor on board the Landsat 8 and 9 satellites. This is the, the TIRS, or T-I-R-S, uh, thermal infrared um, sensor. And like bands number one, all the way through till nine, were all the OLI, the, um, I think it's the operational land imager or optical land imager. I know that the first nine bands are for land imaging and they are in wavelength ranges that are definitely a lot uh, more narrow and um, compared to the thermal. The thermal is completely different. So this particular uh, channel right here, what I want to do is I want to symbolize it in a different way, uh, thinking of kind of like a, I don't know, with like surface temperature in mind. And uh, let's do that. So we can go percent clip, and we can go with uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.1, and then uh, leave it with a gamma of 1. But let's choose a color ramp here, and let's colorize this thing based on uh, temperature. So blue to red, right? Something like that. That's super cool. And let's do the same for band number 11, right? So percent clip. 1 and we'll go color ramp right there. Now you can choose other color ramps, but I mean this is uh, what we're doing, right? This is what we are doing. Very, very cool. There it be. All right. Now, how do you compare bands to each other? We want to toggle bands off and on between each other. I've already done a little bit of that, you know, as I was going through each band individually, talking about them very, very briefly. Uh, we notice certain things like water being dark or land being light. That's uh, that's that's something that you know we were gonna we're gonna start talking about in more depth. Um, but for right now, we're learning how to bring the imagery in and get it working and work with it in. In, in individual bands and also work with it in multi-band scenarios, right? So um, let's start looking at these bands individually and comparing them. There are There's a tool set in Arc Pro that you can use um, and really the compare tools are kind of neat. So uh, I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna choose a couple of different bands, two of them specifically. I'm gonna choose band number one and band number six. Okay, and I'm going to zoom into about here so that we can see uh, a decent amount of land and a decent amount of water and some variation in different earth surface features, right? That's what we want. This is, there's some uh, industrial, there's some uh, urban, there's some mountainous barren areas, there's some shoreline areas really really interesting so what do they look like you can turn them on and off you can compare them this way 
right? So what happened there was I turned off the air, uh, coastal aerosol band, um, and that's band number one, and left the shortwave number two band on. Essentially, that's how our comparison tools work. You can turn things on and off like that, right? You can do it manually here. Sometimes you want to be able to um, have things manually turn on and off, or sorry, not manually, you want it to be work automatically. So uh, up here, if you click on raster layer up on the ribbon, and with the topmost layer selected that you want to compare, uh, there is this compare tool area right here, right? And uh, let's just say I put in a little bit of a slower comparison, uh, basically is I think one second. So if I click this flicker button, what it does is it actually turns things on and off for me so that I don't have to do it. And then all of a sudden I'm hands free and I can see uh, more so what's happening. And uh, if I remember right, this actually, you can zoom in and it still is working. So, you know, for me, all of a sudden I can explore this image and do some comparisons uh, without having to manually toggle all the visibility uh, on and off for comparators. So the amount of contrast is really interesting and you can see that there are what appear to be aquaculture uh, setups pretty far inland because uh, the dark, dark, the, the areas with very low or no reflectivity are water in band 7 and there's lots of them around here kind of neat now there's also other things I wonder what kind of um, eutrophication problems they have in this there's just probably a lot of nutrients going into the water as well I think that might be what we're seeing too anyways that's one of the compare tools right uh, I'm going to click it off so that we can get back to where we were. There's another one that I think is kind of neat too, and it's called a swipe. Uh, swipe or no swiping? <laughs> As my daughter would say. So there we go. Um, if I activate the swipe tool, this arrow comes on screen. This little black arrow, you can fly it around. And with the topmost layer selected in the table of contents, what you can do is you can swipe away it to reveal the bottom layer, right? So and you can zoom in and swipe and zoom out and swipe. And these tools, these comparator tools, can be really, really uh, effective for um, just visualizing things in different band combinations if you're in color or if you're just going one band against another band like we're doing here, it's also very, very useful. So um, there you go, there's some comparators, and uh, you know, you can do one versus seven, or you can do, you know, uh, I don't know if there's much difference between nine, uh, 10 and 11, uh, we can check. If we go to band 10 and we select it, I don't know if there's really much difference at all. Is one more sensitive to the atmosphere, right? Um, I don't see a lot of difference, except in here maybe. Don't really know what that means. We would have to investigate it, but uh, there is a slight difference. It's kind of interesting, right? So there it is. In the uh, assignment itself, right after you finish playing around with the compare tools, I mean, and pause me here. Take some time, play around with it. Play around with your everything. Uh, I expect you to be pausing and playing and rewinding and rewatching and doing all of that with this video because uh, that's what I'm making it for. Um, here you can see uh, I've already gone ahead a little bit and for comparison I've added uh, a couple of things. So in class we talked about how you're going to get eight marks if you put together some comparisons. It says provide two comparisons of earth surface features that reflect differently. Right? So that's what we're trying to do here. And uh, the example that was given here is uh, in Iceland. And uh, we can go and have a look at it if you want, but um, it's right here already. And it's kind of nice to be able to see them side by side as well. Right? Because in, in ArcGIS Pro, they're overlaid on top of each other and it can. 
be a little tricky unless you use the flicker or compare or manually toggle them on and off. Sometimes it's nice just to grab them, put them into a page and look at them side by side and have them uh, sort of captive to look. So um, when you're doing your comparison here, I want you to take the time to put together a decent uh, description of what's actually happening in your comparison, right? I want to know the scale that it's at. I want to know which bands are being compared. Uh, and I want to know about what some of the Earth's surface features are doing in uh, different bands. I want to know how they're reflecting. Like, what does water look like? What does, or whatever you are actually going after, right? So, you know, uh, down here you can see uh, I've got uh, this Incheon, uh, South Korea area. And you can see I'm comparing what looks to be band three against band five. And then it looks like I'm comparing band one against band five. So uh, the key to this is that I want the screenshots to be exactly the same scale, exactly the same size, and I want them right beside each other. How do I do that? All right. Let's go back here and let's uh, turn on band number four and number... No, yeah, seven, seven, okay, there we go. So band number four and band number seven are interesting. Um, and if I select band number four, I can use a comparator tool to see if I like the difference, see if there's any change. Uh, to me, it looks like there's some interesting things going on in that in band number four, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between vegetation and water. If you look really closely, Band number seven does it, no problem. Band number four, there's all of these like lakes inland that kind of disappear in band number four, right? And the vegetation gets a little bit darker in band four, but this is something that I want to showcase. So I'm going to zoom in to, I don't know, about 100,000. And uh, let's, let's talk about that. So I have band number four first. How do I take a screenshot? Listen carefully. I'm going to hold down the Windows key, the Shift key, and then press the letter S all at the same time. And what that does is it sets up my screen so that I can use this crosshair here to, this is built into the Windows operating system, and I grab this whole thing. Okay, that's the red. And I'm going to go to my Word doc these are and I'm gonna paste it in right uh, right below I know I'm taking up more space and it's actually a massive picture uh, I want to see them side by side so uh, what I've noticed is that you've got to reduce them down depending on the resolution of your screen for me it was about five and a half centimeters uh, where I could get them beside each other so there's one and I know that that's the red band and I'm gonna to have to remember this I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna turn off the red band to expose the shortwave infrared 2 band here and I'm not going to move anything. All I'm going to do is take another screenshot. Okay, and grab it and go. Okay, let's go over to here. I'm going to try to put it beside. Of course it won't fit unless it's the exact same size. For me, what I found that worked was five and a half centimeters in height. And you want to constrain those proportions so that they are both the same size. And we'll uh, center them. And then uh, put a space in between them. Oops. Center them again. Space between, hopefully. So, I mean, what's essentially happening here is I'm looking at the red band versus the shortwave infrared band, and I want to discuss and talk about the reflectance values that are in here. Now, on the left, the red band is showing vegetation to be relatively dark, and that's true, because vegetation eats red light. We've talked about that already. Photosynthesis, right? Uh, blue and red are pulled in, and... Uh, 
green and near infrared are reflected, right? So uh, the short wave infrared is showing not a whole lot of reflectance uh, in with vegetation, but very very little reflectance with water. It's almost completely black on the water side. So there's some things to talk about there, and that's what you know. Again, this explanation up here talks is is a good one. Uh, I'm also adding uh, a reference as to where this imagery was sourced and uh, the scene ID for it. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Two examples. Right. And then what does it want to do? Oh, and then it says compare the panchromatic, and number eight, and one of the thermals. So I did that here, did I? No, I didn't. I guess I'm going to have to go and do that. No big deal. So band number eight, I'm going to get a screenshot of it. Let's go find something interesting. Let's go right here. And with band number eight, uh, if I zoom in to one-to-one -one source resolution, look at how close I can zoom in and have like a really, really nice uh, crisp image. So again, the contrast stretches are all the same. And I'm going to pull this right here. And I'm going to put it right here. And I'm going to size it. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab the other one, but it's going to be the thermal. Right, so in the thermal right here, same uh, thing, I'm going to grab a screenshot and uh, place it right beside the other, and it should fit. format of the picture helps me to reduce the size and then uh, we can put them beside each other. Oh, it doesn't want to fit beside it this time. Why not? Alright, well, that's not fun. Let's uh, go to 5.4. There we go. Now they're beside each other. The same point. This one's going to have to be 5 corners as well. Okay, there they are. They're beside each other. Same thing. I want a description. I want you to tell me what's happening. And you can see the example is asking you to uh, describe the differences and the variations of uh, what you're seeing, right? What you're looking at. That'll get you two marks. Now, next, let's work with multiple layers or multiple bands. And uh, in this tutorial, you can see that it describes, you know, um, bands. Then it starts to talk about channels. Lots of people get them confused. They are very similar words. I like to use them separately. I like to consider. I like to think of channels as being um, the input channels that the software or anything uses to display data. Right. So it's kind of like um, it's a channel, like a TV channel or a radio channel. Right. Uh, but bands, the bands that are um, the actual data from the Landsat 8 and 9 satellites in this case, uh, that those are bands, right? So bands versus channels, there's a distinction there that needs to be made. We can only view three channels at a time in color, red, green, and blue. Okay, So RGB imagery can be depicting or showing in its channels. You can have in the red channel, you put the red data, and in the green channel, you put the green data, in the blue channel, you put the blue data, and you're going to have true color imagery. And uh, that's fine. That's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you that. So let's uh, flip back here, and uh, let's actually get our catalog pane. And uh, I'm going to drag across this multispectral MTL file again. And what it is, is it's metadata that, that allows, oh, I already have it. It's metadata that allows uh, the software here to 
display three bands simultaneously, and when you combine all those brightnesses together, right, that's when you get a color image, right? So things that are really, really bright on the red channel, band number four, are going to show up as being really, really red, right? And things that are really, really green are going to be uh, green because on the green band, in band number three, there are really, really bright values, right? So um, this multispectral, what we'll do is uh, we'll apply a stretch to it, percent clip, and uh, we'll turn everything else off. And we're going to definitely clean up this data to make it look appropriate. There we go. And this is actually, yeah, this is what it's supposed to look like. Um, that is, wow, it's got a, an interesting look to it, actually. It's very, uh, very blue. All right, so this is true color. This is a true color image, right? That's what we're looking at. And interestingly, uh, you've got different areas that are showing up differently. Wow, look at the way the rocks are up here versus the way the rocks are down here. It's not ever interesting. The way everything looks down here is very different. That's super cool. <laughs> Look at all the golf courses. My goodness. The aquaculture and so on. So there's a lot to explore here. Now, true color data, this is what we're looking at. Okay, I'm going to zoom out and we're going to look at it just like that. In the tutorial, or sorry, in this exercise, this assignment, it's uh, asking you to do a few things. It said drag and drop the multispectral metadata layer, and it talks about you know all of the the true color versus that, and it says to use a stretch type, a percent clip, um, 0 0.1 0 .1 for the min, 0 0.1 for the max. And it's saying use gamma levels of 2, 2, and 2. Um, now, this is something that's going to work for the, the Iceland imagery, but it won't work for the imagery that I just downloaded, and it may not work for your imagery, right? Like, this is uh, gamma of 1 all the way across the board, and it looks proper. If I go to this Iceland one, right, let's see if I've got uh, anything here. I've got to go to my Iceland folder, don't I? If I grab the MTL for this one and expand it, and then bring in the multispectral and put it up here where it belongs, what I'm saying is. Uh, I'm going to work with the percent clip here and let's go with 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. But look at how dark it is. Alright, so um, we're going to have to uh, brighten that up by using a gamma of 2. So see that using a gamma of 2 makes this imagery look a little bit nicer. Right? This is the Iceland imagery, and you can see that with the higher gamma, it makes sense. And that's just the way it goes. But the other map, Korean map, we need to use a gamma of 1. So the symbology pane is interactive, and you always kind of have to think about what things are, what they look like, and how you want them to look, and so on. Right? So... That's, uh, that's important. In the Word doc, it's asking you for, um, it's asking you, describe below what these separate gamma levels represent. All right, if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, what would happen if I decided to turn up one of the gamma levels to five instead? Oh boy. What did I just do? Well, the gamma, the second of the three gammas, corresponds with the second of the three channels. So I just turned up I just turned up the green like way, way too much. This is interesting because you can 
fine-tune the gamma, right? If you needed to maybe turn the blue down just a little bit, like a 0 0.95 or something like that, what that essentially does is it just takes a little bit of a, it tweaks the imagery, it makes it look exactly, like if you have very, very uh, fine taste with regards to how you want your imagery to look, you can fine-tune the gamma, right? Gamma red, gamma green, gamma, gamma blue. All right, all right, what's next? So you're going to put that answer in there. I'm not going to type it out for you. Place a screen capture below with a scale of one to a million. So if I take this one out, uh, if I go to my document here and I go to one to a million, that's one to a million. I'm going to bring this up here. Take a screenshot of it. I should be able to place that inside. A little box. Right? Oops. Where is it? Where did it go? There it is. Right? And it should fit. It maybe. Oh my goodness, what is even happening right now? There we go. You can crop it a wee bit so it fits a bit better. You can also shrink this. to the picture format, I should be able to bring this down to like, I don't know, 12 or something. That helps. Maybe bring it down even more so it fits on the same page. There we go. 12 to 10. That'll work. Alright, so if I put that in there, you can see that uh, you don't need to put uh, pref uh, references in there, but you get five marks for adding your image in there in a nice uh, true color wavelength range or, or band combination it's called okay the next one is asking you to uh, grab some properties uh, from this multi spectral metadata layer okay so columns cell size pixel depth um, some of them are going to be the same across all Landsat imagery because they're sensor based uh, but some of them might be different especially the spatial reference right so uh, the data should be all the same WGS84 Spheroid, transverse mercator, I think. Anyways, let's go have a look. Uh, where is it? Right here. Right. How do we figure out what the properties are? When in doubt, right click on stuff. And if we open up the properties for this multi spectral layer, right here, we should get a whole bunch of information available to us the spatial reference extent, the statistics, the band metadata, the raster metadata, the raster information. Look at all of this stuff. Right? Everything from how large the image is to the number of columns and rows. So 7841 and 7961. That's interesting. And we've got eight bands. We've got 30 for its cell size, 952 Megs, right? So uh, in the Word document, where is it? Right here, right? It's asking for specifics, right? Um, the spheroid is WGS84, sorry, and the datum is DWGS84. And the projection is transverse Mercator. That's it. Right? So you're going to be pulling all of this from you're going to be 
pulling all of this from the properties, right? So you're going to put all of that in pixel depth. Um, you'll find out a 16 bit, right? Now the next part, ensure that the contents pane, the multispectral span is RGB, right click in the red, change it to near for red five, change the green to red four, and the green and the, the blue channel to green. In other words, let's make a false color image. So what we're going to do is uh, have a little bit of fun now, because I absolutely love multispectral imagery. Landsat has a lot of spectral resolution. Uh, there's a lot of different wavelength ranges available. Uh, you can see them. Just you know, right click on one of these channels, and you'll see all of the bands that are available to be input. Right. So near for red, if we put that in the red, all of a sudden the image is going to start to look different almost immediately. And if we put the red into the green and the blue into the in the green into the blue, sorry, <laughs> uh, it's, it can be a little bit difficult to uh, keep my channels versus my bands uh, separate. But that's that's the way it goes. So um, the near infrared, really, what it does is it makes all of your vegetation turn bright red. And there's a way of toning that down. What I usually do is uh, I turn it down to like 0.5. And what that does is it sort of strips away a lot of the extra red. And um, then I bump up the green a little bit to like 1.2, which is the red data. And then bump this one up a little bit as well. And what that does is it pushes the imagery a little bit so that different types of vegetation can show up in different ways like look at these mountains right in here right see how they start to go a little bit purple near the top what that indicates to me is that there are uh, vegetation forms at the top of these mountains uh, that are needle bearing conifers well, that's kind of neat and uh, as you move across, you can see that there's all kinds of weird things happening with regards to the vegetation. And some of this is just amazing to look at with regards to its textures, right? Like this is just fantastic. I love this kind of stuff. Look at all of this. Look at the different textures and patterns in this area. This is blowing me away. Just blowing me away. Amazing. Right? Anyways, that is uh, the near infrared false color type. What does water look like? It doesn't go completely black. In fact, it goes kind of dark, dark blue, which is neat. And um, we've got some aquaculture things happening. And we've got airports. And we've grassy areas, we've got agricultural areas, right? The golf courses show up really neat, They're like little tiny worms all over the place, right? Um, so, mall, uh, it's important to think about modifying the uh, gamma every time you change band combinations, okay? So, anyways, uh, the Word doc asks you at this point to take some time to explore the scene, decide on a few interesting areas that show good contrast of color, um, and place screen captures of two different areas in the boxes below. Zoom to one to one resolution. So, right click the multi spectral layer and zoom to one to one resolution. What does that mean? Right. What does one to one resolution mean? Well, currently, if, I, if I'm, you know, looking here and I zoom out, I'm not at one-to-one -one resolution. What I'm at is, uh, well, I can see almost the entire scene. This is like, if I right-click here and say zoom to layer, that's what it's going to do. It's going to zoom out to the whole layer. If I want to zoom to one-to-one -one resolution, what that means is how close can I zoom in? What is the largest scale I can zoom to that will give uh, me uh, maximum resolution? What is the maximum resolution or one-to-one -one resolution? So right click and say zoom to source resolution right display the selected image at its optimal resolution uh, for landsat 8 data it's right around one to a hundred thousand ish okay and you can
can see everything. Nothing looks pixelated. <clears throat> Excuse me. And by pixelated, I mean if I were to zoom in too close, right, everything just looks kind of like a dog's breakfast. We don't want that. So you zoom to the optimal resolution and you can see everything quite nice. Now you can kind of push it a little bit. Like my screen, I usually push it to 100,000. Sometimes I'll even go a little further than that. But there, this is apparently the optimal um, scale to view 30 meter pixels. Okay, that's, that's that. And, uh, and then it says take a couple of screenshots. So you know how to take screenshots. I'm not telling you to, you know, play around, but it is, it is saying to experiment with different wavelength uh, band combinations. So if I were to say, let's do a short wave infrared two, right? Instantly, things are starting to look pretty interesting, right? So percent clip, if I go gamma and I say, 0 0.5 on the red. If I want to bring that up to 0 0.6, what's happening? There's a lot of redness happening, right? Why? It's because the short wave infrared uh, is, is, is coming into play. Now, what is, is there any separability going on with vegetation here? I'm not really seeing much. Now, what if I wanted to add this near infrared into my next band here? There's a lot more vibration coming off the near infrared. And now we're talking, I love this. Uh, so let's, it's a little too green, so let's add some gamma to that red channel. And uh, now we're talking. And then uh, the blue, let's instead of the green band, let's put in the, uh, mm, the red. This would be a 754. Let's add some blue here. Just one there and see what goes on. Right. Um, this is interesting to look at, right? Because now we've got different things going on. What am I what am I looking at here? Well, all of the water is showing up as like this really nice rich blue color. Anything that's like urban is showing up as like a pink. Right, and then, uh, or or like a, almost like a magenta even, and then anything that is uh, vegetated is showing up as very green. Um, I'm just loving this, super cool, right? And uh, you know, that would be a really cool screen capture, now, wouldn't it? Um, anyways, and you can just keep going and say, oh, okay, well, let's try. Um, what about? coastal aerosol and then make sure you remember your gamma levels and what are we looking at what are we looking at well it seems to me like there's a fair amount of runoff and a fair amount of almost like the water doesn't look very appealing or maybe there's just a lot of silt or turbidity I don't know uh, there's something going on there there's a lot of water that's trapped and not moving freely so is it like stagnation or what is happening there with all of the aquaculture right that's happening what is all of Right? What are they farming? What is this stuff? <sighs> Most of it's kelp and seaweed, I think. So, is there a lot of nutrients? I don't know. But, there you go. So, you got to do a bunch of screenshots there. And then, uh, the last thing that you've got to do is, uh, you've got to wonder about, you know, this uh, multi-spectral layer. It says, um, why is this ntl.txt so useful even though it has such a small file size right um, I don't know if I can find one super quick but uh, let's see I won't I don't know if I'm gonna be able to grab the, uh, the same MTL but let's see if I can find one well, I might be able to here's the Korean one right here so if I were
were to open up the MTL, which is straight down here. What's in there? It's a lot of information. And it's weird though, because when you add this to Arc Pro, right? It gives you a listing of like all of these things. So it's like it's an index that sort of tells you about what's happening in the imagery, right? And if there's statistics and all of that is just built into the, these support files. They're lovely. A lot of sensors come with support files and the support files are used uh, in software to make it easier to work with the data. That's basically what we're looking at. So think about it that way. The MTLs support the data. Um, there's support files that allow us to use them. Like you don't even need to have all of these bands in your map. Like if I remove them, I don't lose anything from having my multispectral in there, right? It's just something to think about. Um, the other thing that we need to do in the assignment, and I'm trying to sort of push this, uh, the pad sharpen layer, um, needs to be brought in. So there's another support file uh, in the same MTL uh, that's for pan sharpening. And pan sharpening is something that's really interesting to view and to also um, think about. So if I grab this pan sharpen, uh, which is another uh, one of them, I bring it in and put it above the multispectral layer, what I need to do is uh, I need to give it the same stretch, percent clip, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, there we go, and we should be ready to go. Now, it doesn't look any different, does it? Well, I'll tell you, it is. It's different because it has 15 meter pixels. So if I was to zoom into something that's very, very uh, detailed, right? Something like whatever this is, you know, it doesn't look that great in the pan sharpened, but it looks even worse in the 30 meters, right? So if I were to swipe this away, I should be able to swipe it. Why isn't it working? Oh, <laughs> it's the wrong one, that's why. That's that's the one in Iceland. Holy, I'm just having a great day. Let's get the right one at least, right? Hand sharpen, let's bring it in. And let's... Um, clip. I apologize for that. It's uh, a long life. All right, now we're talking. There we go. Look at how lovely that looks. Now, the difference between it and the multispectral, right? You can see it plain as day. So the different sized pixels make a big difference, right? If I use the swipe, you can see it. Right? So anywhere you look, um, you can see big, big differences in the uh, pixels. So what is the maximum or the optimal resolution uh, or the optimal scale for the pan sharpen? If I click on it and go to one-to-one -one source resolution, it says it's around 1 to 50,000. Well, I can zoom in basically twice as far on the pan sharpen. I always push it a little bit more, and uh, you can see much more clarity you have in that pan sharpened. And it also uh, works in um, the near infrared. Um, strangely enough, it's not really supposed to, but it does. Uh, I, I'm, I like to think that the panchromatic bands wavelength ranges, being the visible range, um, 
don't really overlap in the near infrared band, but they seem to still work okay. So to show you what I mean, if I go near infrared, red, and green, I still have that resolution. Uh, and if I go the same down here. still have that resolution, right? And I still lose it. So that extra resolution matches fairly well. If you were to try to, you know, pan sharpen uh, the other layers, it wouldn't work, right? So that's something to keep in mind. You can't pan sharpen the um, shortwave infrareds using the panchromatic band because the, the wavelength ranges don't line up. That's really important think about. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. And uh, there you go. I mean, that's that's basically the, the explanation that I have with regards to pad sharpening is you can use that panchromatic band with the 15 meter pixels. The brightness levels that you have on there will match the true color band combinations. And the thing is, is that if you burn the pixel brightness levels from the panchromatic into the, the, the blue, the green, the red, and, and the near infrared bands, you can essentially have um, a color 15 meter band combination, uh, which is essentially uh, the highest spatial resolution you're going to get out of the Landsat 8 and 9 sensors. It's lovely. I, I just love the fact that, you know, it would be nice if you could zoom in a little bit more, but if you were going to be able to zoom in a little bit more, the problem is, is that you're going to have to reduce your, your footprint, right? So Landsat is a lovely sensor in that, you know, it gives you a really large area of land. I mean, I can use a measurement tool here and um, say, okay, we're roughly, you know, almost 200 kilometers across uh, by 200 and whatever tall. That's a massive footprint, you know, compared to other sensors. You know, the Sentinel sensor, the, uh, the European uh, Space Agency's uh, sensor, we're going to be looking at it as well in a later class, and uh, it's got a smaller footprint and it's got a higher spatial resolution, and it also collects uh, a lot of different wavelength ranges, and it's, it's also a lovely sensor to look at too. So Earth imaging, Earth observation, we need to know how to handle the imagery in, in this case, ArcGIS Pro, and uh, have a good understanding of how it all works before we get into working with, you know, any kind of mapping applications or classifications and some of the things that are coming down the pipe for us in future classes. So I hope that uh, this has been a good lesson. And fill in all of these to get your full marks. Try to take some time to appreciate the imagery as well. Like, like I said, you know, this Landsat demo over here, we were just taking some time to appreciate some of the areas on the world and how beautiful they are, right? Um, it's just so interesting to see all of the different patterns that are associated with different Earth surface features and different locations on our planet. Like, it's, it's my favorite. All right. That's it. All for now. Good luck with the assignment. Uh, we'll take another run at it next week, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.